What is Right to Life Sunday? Again. Blood. Talk about blood for a moment. The medical people tell us, just as the Old Testament says, the life of a creature is in its blood. Your blood is unhealthy, you have a problem. If it's terribly unhealthy, you will be dying. Blood. God speaks of blood. Does blood speak back to God and to us? Years ago, a colleague in the church who was a bit of a math genius did the calculations. And it was, this was years ago. Enough blood has been spilled of the innocent unborn since 1972 to fill that stadium in Ann Arbor, that big, huge place, all the way to the top, two or three times, spilling over that much blood. Think about that. I wonder why God allows such evil. At the end of our service, we'll sing our favorite. It's a plaintive song. It's a pleading song. It's passionate. I cannot tell why he whom angels worship would grace this place, this great place of tears. It's a brutal world. It's a bloody world. Would you stand for a moment of learning together? When I open the paper and I see that someone has brutalized someone else, I see the terrible things you see. Dreadful things. I say, God, oh God, why do you allow such things? If I was there, I would have tried to stop it. You did not. God, oh God, why do you allow such things? I guess the answer is because God told Adam, okay, if you don't obey me, you'll be living in a world of breakage and death. And God keeps his promises. He can't say, well, I didn't mean it. And so one day God received an offering from two brothers, Cain and Abel. And the one offering from Abel was quite satisfactory. I don't know what it was. Cain's was an offense to God. Perhaps it was just leftover, something he didn't need anyway. And so God commended Abel, but he rebuked Cain for his offering. And then Cain came up behind Abel and he killed him. Killed him. God allowed it. The question this morning is this. What did God say to Cain after Cain killed his innocent brother Abel? We find it in Genesis 4. I'll read it to you first. What have you done? Listen. Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Blood can talk. Blood cries out. It's actually an active tense in that passage. It says your brother's blood is crying out to me the ground. Your brother's blood is petitioning me from the ground, calling to me, asking me for justice. The question is, what did God say to Cain after Cain killed his brother Abel? Together, please. What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me. pastor's message today is entitled, Why Every Christian Should Be Pro-Life. It's taken from the text of Genesis uh, chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. Genesis chapter 9, starting at verse 1. Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall upon all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air, upon every creature that moves along the ground, and upon all the fish of the sea. They are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. But now you must, but now you must, but you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. And for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal, and from each man too. I will demand an accounting for the life of his fellow man. Whoever sheds the sheds the blood of of man. By man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made man. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. 
Thank you, Pastor Larson, for your fine reading. This is not a sermon about capital punishment, but it is interesting that the very first thing that God said to Noah after the flood was frankly a demand for capital punishment. A lot of you, some of you at least, will recoil at that and say, well, no, 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 wait, 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 I don't believe in capital punishment. You can't be pro-life and be for capital punishment. Sure you can be, God is. The pro-life issue is an issue of justice. It is possible to forego your right to life. Here's what God said. For your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. If a man sheds the innocent blood of another man, takes his life, he has given up his right to life, and so by man shall his blood be shed. That was not a prediction. That was not a prophecy. That was a prescription. God called for it. It's a horrible thing to contemplate. I realize there are a million problems with capital punishment. Different sermon. I'm not advocating it in a capricious or careless way. I'm just saying that in the mind of God, there is a time when the person loses their right to life. Or an animal. He made reference to an animal. When man becomes an animal. Last summer, a pit bull in our area tore to, tore to pieces and ultimately killed a toddler not too far from here. Some troopers came to the house, and the dog was still causing a problem. They killed it, and they shot it. There was some outrage over that poor dog. It's just a dog being a dog. According to the Word of God, that dog sacrificed its right to life by being a murderous killer dog. This is a serious matter. We better take God seriously. And you know, before we pray, let me say something. I'm on your side. I say this with affection. We Christians should stop judging God. You know when we judge God, when we say things like, well, you know, I just don't think that God would approve of capital punishment because it seems too mean and unforgiving. Well, really? (laughs) He wiped out a whole population with a flood. Be careful when you judge God. I hear it so often. I I don't think God would ask a a person with um, sexual disorientation who wants to live a a gay life. I don't think he'd ask that person to deprive themselves of intimacy their whole life. It just doesn't seem fair. They didn't ask for that problem. Yeah, he would. He certainly would. He absolutely would. We can't go changing that because, well, we don't think God ought to do that. That's just not how it works. God wouldn't really send people to hell like forever and ever. I just don't think that's true. Whatever the Word of God says, he absolutely would, and he does. And God has uh, got a wrathful side. And because of that, the church has lost its witness. The church has almost no prophetic witness to a desperately dying culture because it's so much easier to just get together, sing praise songs, have a good time, give some hugs, drink some coffee, go home and wait to go to heaven. That's what we do. A lot of Christians do that. And so God said, really? Well, I am giving the first commandment to Adam, starting the, uh, to Noah, starting the race over again. And here it is, Noah. There's a lot of important things to worry about. The climate, refugees, justice, Marriage, gay marriage, the problem, how to minister. He didn't talk about any of those things. Yeah, they're all important things. He said, the very first thing you've got to hear from me, Noah, is this. You better make it clear that I flooded the whole planet in order to deal with those who were so vicious. All they did was kill each other. And I want you to know and make sure you know this and your kids know this, that I will demand an accounting. Interesting and scary. And yet, the killing in the womb continues. And the church has such a muted, lethargic, hopeless, indifferent, pathetic witness. I was with a lot of good pastors this last week. All of them good. But I mentioned to one man, I've got to slip away. I want to work for a couple of hours on my right to life sermon. I have to work on my sermon on abortion. He said to me, why would you do that? I'm not trying to be funny. Why would you do that? Pray with me, please. Well, Father in heaven, we pray, I pray. Number one, for the person who's here who has this in their background, a woman might be listening to this, and this still hurts. They know. Every, in a sense, every, every woman is a mom. It's wired into them. Whether they ever bear children or not, they're moms. And they know where their heart is. Please be the God of comfort then this next half hour. Pray for the man who caused the problem or is the problem. For the man who came up with the $500 to get rid of the problem, I pray for him. I pray for the unsaved. I pray for the person here that needs Christ and might be distracted by this topic. I pray that 
cornerstone would continue to be a witness speaking prophetically into the culture. Let us not be pathetic, but prophetic Jesus. When I say something unhelpful in your sight, and I know I will, please bring it to nothing in quickly, for we pray in your name. Amen. I have a friend named Rufus, not a close friend, but a man I know and admire him. We have a friendship. Rufus is a big, tall guy, good-looking guy, smart as a whip. He was an athlete some years ago, very impressive guy. And he's a pastor. He, he moved a few years ago from Texas to one of our churches in the Carolinas. In fact, it's our largest EPC church, very dynamic place, and he is dynamic. Rufus is a black man, African-American. So we're having dinner the other night. I said, so how was it when you made your move from, you know, one, one church to the other? Big challenge? Or was it? He said, no, you know, usual stuff. He said, I lost 500 people the first week. <laughs> it's the kind of thing clergy talk about when they get together. Oh, I mean, I can lose them wholesale. I said, I'm good at this. I said, 500? He said, yeah, because I'm a black man. He said, I, I literally had people come and say, you know, I can't sit under a black pastor. Nothing personal. <laughs> it's a good thing Rufus is that's a solid guy. He said, fine, sorry about that. Come back if you change your mind. Can you imagine that? It's unjust, isn't it? Tomorrow's um, Martin Luther King Day here in the white pasty church. That's us, white and pasty. Come on, tell the truth, that's us. We don't give that much thought. He was an imperfect man, but an outstanding man. And he grew very frustrated with the lethargy that he saw in the white population in general, but in particular in the church over the injustices that were being forced still upon black people people of color. And one time in the 60s, he was tossed in jail down in Memphis or in Birmingham. Don and I saw the jail. And if you've never gone online and Googled it and read it, Google a letter from a Birmingham jail. It's five or six pages where he wrote to some leaders in the white community who were criticizing his actions. It's a very articulate letter. He's a very bright guy. And he expressed his frustration with the injustice that it just it didn't seem to be getting much better. And here's what he wrote. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in the stride toward freedom is not the white citizens' council or the Ku Klux Klan, but the more moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice. In other words, the people we need, we can't have lawlessness, I got it. So people who are more concerned with keeping the peace and making sure nobody misbehaves, they are concerned with justice. Now, that's analogous. Stay right with me here. That's analogous to what's happening in the church. And it makes me sick. I, I'm weary of it. Forgive me. I, I just feel like a, I'm crying in the wilderness here. Not among you guys, but out there. When I say to a pastor, I'm, I'm working on my abortion sermon, he says, why would you do that? I just don't want to do with the guy. Because the evangelical church is more interested in singing praise songs and in, in, in making nice and having a good time and, 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 and being a witness, but we just want to have a really good time in the Lord and then die and go to heaven. We don't really have a whole abiding, passionate desire to speak into the culture and confront the culture. Not with arrogance, but with humility. And... Dr. King's frustrations, as I say, remind me of my own because there is no realization typically or very little among our leadership, among our citizens, of the connection between injustice and punishment. I'm trying to say very few Christians these days, including clergy and people with multiple doctorates, understand that God is a God of judgment and that he punishes nations. He punishes people. I know I'll offend a few of you. I'm a flag-waving American. But back on 9-11, I remember thinking, why did God remove the covering here? 
Those were innocent people, got it. And evil people killed them, got it. But he allowed it to happen. That's historically through the scriptures how God punishes nations. He punishes nations by bringing evil people to punish people when they deserve it. And so the prophet Jeremiah kept crying out to Israel, you've got to repent of your sins. You've got to knock off the idolatry and the child sacrifice. That's our sin. Child sacrifice. You've got to stop doing that. But they wouldn't. They wouldn't listen. So God brings the Babylonians down upon them, and they beat the daylights out of them and carry them off into, into slavery. And in his book, his Lamentations that Jeremiah wrote later, look what he said. Zion reaches out her hands, no one to comfort her. The Lord has decreed for Jacob that his neighbors become his foes. You see that? Why in the world would terrorists, evil people, darkened and demonic, 7,000 miles away want to attack, you know, Paris or San Francisco or Brighton? Why would our neighbors on the planet become our foes? See, he's connecting it to evil. It's recompense. Jerusalem has become an unclean thing among them. Why? Because the life of the creature is in the blood. Because when you offend God, he puts up with it just for so long. Oh, I've been reminded 37 times about, you know, Pastor, you'd like to get into the political. Careful, careful, careful. Okay, I'm being careful. But it's chaos, isn't it? Listen to the debates on both sides. These are bright people, smart people. Only one, I won't do names, even suggests that maybe the problems we're having have to do with evil. And I'd really like to sit down with all of them, including our president, and say, do you make any connections here? I mean, think about it. The problem isn't with oil prices. It isn't really with terrorism. It isn't with policy on health. Those are real issues. I got it. God has removed this covering and his blessing because the life of the creature is in the blood. No one would believe that if I said it to them. Now think about this, friends. This thing with gun violence, I mean, it is terrible. We agree. And we do agree. We do agree. We don't know what to do about that. There's room for weeping. I agree. I cringe the same as you do. Oh, no. What do we do about that? They're not going to rescind the Second Amendment. Forget that part. That stays. Let's see. You could arm everybody, I guess. We, we have that issue here. We discuss it. The elders talk about it. What do we do in the church? We haven't had a problem so far. It's not likely we will, but we might. What are you going to do about gun violence? I don't know different sermon, and I don't have the answer. I, I know this, by the way, as long as I touched on it. Your chances of being harmed in a church from violence are about 1 in 18 billion. You're in much more danger driving over here. But you could have a problem, and I could too. But here's what I'm saying. What is it with people who will stand there and weep because 600 people in America died last year from random gun violence, but two to 3,000 a day were killed in the womb. A day. A day. Every day. I'm not saying the gun violence part was good. It's not. It's horrible. But wh what is going on here? And God says, and for your lifeblood, I'll demand an accounting. From every animal, from each man too, I'll demand an accounting. Charles Colson, who was the founder of the Prison Fellowship, was against capital punishment most of his ministry life. He's gone to the Lord now. But a couple years before he went to the Lord, he reversed his stance. He said, no, capital punishment is in there, and I see why now. Because it says, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. Again, this is not a sermon about capital punishment. It's a sermon about justice. God holds man accountable, woman accountable, the human accountable, for the life of the innocent. So as a sermon within the servant, a slight digression, stay right with me, you're going to do a, I'm going to do, go around one of the circles here and come back. The Christian ought to be reminded that God has ordained things in life, entities, in societies, for the peace of the society. 
And that is why we have government and armies and Marine Corps and police and other things. Don't forget, the Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, said rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. You want to be free of fear from anybody in authority? Sure, then do what is right. He'll commend you. He is God's servant to do you good, but if you do wrong, be afraid. He does not bear the sword for nothing. God sends people with the sword. He's an agent of God's wrath. Now, all the way back to where I was before. Hopefully, you won't leave here all hangdog and totally discouraged from this sermon. I'm, I'm pessimistically optimistic on this. <laughs> God is at work because God is a God of wrath and judgment, but a God of mercy. But what he wants, what I'm sure he wants America to see, and what the church needs to say into the culture and isn't saying, because pastors like that good guy that I was with, why would you want to do that? I said, well, please help me here. The church has to, has to speak into the culture because judgment is a function of, of God's demand for accountability. And if we keep doing what we're doing, I'm amazed that it's gone this long. But could it be? Ah, could it be that the current dilemma, right? The economy, the stock market on its ear again, terrorism, threats all over the place, all that acrimony between all the candidates. I mean, get them all in the same room, they'd kill each other. Could it be that what's happening now is the cutting edge of judgment from a wrathful God? Remember, let me go back to something I've shared before. It's been a while. Toward the end of the Civil War, President Lincoln was asked, in the end, what was this all about? Well, historians will say, well, it was all about the fact that the, the southern states didn't have the, econ the economic infrastructure that the North had, and they were afraid they'd be dominated because the North was insisting they get rid of their slaves. Well, on, a, on, a, on an immediate level, that is part of what it was about, that's for sure. But about something deeper than that. In Lincoln's view, the Civil War was God's judgment upon America for slavery. And here's what he said in his second inaugural. Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray, that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away, and yet if God wills that it continue, until all the wealth piled by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk. That is, if all the money gained in the last two and a half centuries by those people who took other human beings and made them their slaves, if it's going to take however long for them to lose all of that until every drop of blood drawn with a lash shall be paid for by another drawn with a sword. As was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said that the judgments of the Lord are true and altogether righteous, righteous altogether. In other words, he was saying was 2% of America in those days, 600,000 people died killing each other. And he was saying it's basically the same amount of blood and brutality that's been inflicted upon the black race dragged here from the west coast of Africa. God is not playing games. But, but our current leadership and our current Christian community doesn't see this. Forgive me for talking about myself again, but you know, I, I don't remember standing up at a general assembly for our denomination some years ago and asking for a, a paper that would address a statement we could make to President Clinton about abortion. I was ruled out of order and told to sit down. Not funny. What have you done, God said? Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. A, a few Right to Life Sundays ago, after speaking, I had someone say, politely, I'm still not sure you, you've made a point, though, that God considers the unborn child fully a person, like, you know, Steve and Ashley and Donna, and me, and we, we see we're people. Yeah, you know, you're people. But what about the unborn child? Three real delightful passages, important passages, and I'm moving towards closure, but stay with me a couple minutes. The one we just looked at on this. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and in a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. Why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb lived for joy. This is, this is incredible. John the Baptist is in her womb. He's six months old. Jesus is in Mary's womb. He's about three weeks old, and they're texting <laughs> or something, right? They're doing something. I mean, they're talking, right? 
This is tremendous. The two babies are like communicating. Hey, when should we get started, John? I don't know. Let's get born first. But I mean, there's total personhood activity going on here. These are babies in the womb. At 21 days, the, the baby does, doesn't yet have a heartbeat. But they're people. They're just undeveloped human people. Their body's undeveloped. Of course they're people. What else are they? Psalm 139, Psalm 51, when David sinned with Bathsheba. He says, I know my transgressions. My sin is always before me. Against you and you only I, have I sinned. I've done what's evil in your sight. You're proved right when you judge. You're justified when you judge. Oh, God, I know I see it. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. From the moment of conception, a sin nature settles in on that person. Only Jesus was born without one. Of course, they're, they have a sin nature. You know me. I'm a wise guy and a joker. I mean, I've, we've got so many gals expecting here in the church we have. Including on the staff, we have like babies everywhere. I like to go over and say, how's the little sinner doing in there? You know, I mean, these are, these are according to the word of God, people. <laughs> Finally, let me show you a verse from Exodus that's not much appreciated because it's complicated. A professor of mine years ago Dr. Meredith Klein wrote a paper called Lex Talionis and the Human Fetus. That's impressive, isn't it? Lex Talionis is Latin for the tooth law, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. And Dr. Klein explained the complicated text that's found in, in Exodus. It's talking about an unborn child. Let me show it to you. If men who are fighting hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely, but there's no serious injury, the offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands and the court will allow. But if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Now, what's he talking about? If she gave birth prematurely, this is about the child being prematurely born because of the wrestling and the jostling. Some would say, no, that, that means if she miscarried, no, it doesn't mean that. That's a minority translation of a difficult text. But look, think of it this way. See that line that says, she gives birth prematurely? Take that out for a moment. Let it read this way. If men are fighting to hit a pregnant woman, but there's no serious injury, then it would be injury to the woman. Can you guys see that? Because there'd be no mention of the child. Bill, you're with me? But it does say, however, she gives birth prematurely. Obviously, this is in reference to the child or the mother, but certainly to the child as well. And, and if it, it works out okay, okay, fine. But if there is, see, see, God is attributing here in this part of his word that this is a little person with the same rights. So that if two men get too violent and they fall into this and the child is lost, or the mother, or the child, the man has to give up his own life because that child in God's eyes is a person with a right to life. Pretty hard, isn't that? Now, God's people, you know, hear this, and sometimes you think, well, I mean, I do it too. Like, well, is this an actionable sermon? I mean, what can I do about this? I can write a check for $100 to the pregnancy center. That's a good idea. I can volunteer in the right to life thing. I can, you know, there's a lot of things we can do that are very immediate and practical. But we think, you know, they're still doing this. I mean, it's the law, so what can we tell you? Well, let me show you of the value of prayer in all of this. And my guess is we are, as a church, severely underprayed. Um, I'll have some fun with you for just a minute. I, we're underprayed. I was in, uh, I mentioned Orlando last week, and I was alone. Usually I don't travel without Donna because I need someone to tell me what to do. <laughs> My life is filled with women telling me what to do. Rose tells me what to do. Carla tells me what to do. Donna tells me what to do. And I have that OnStar thing in my car, and it's always a woman's voice telling me what to do. <laughs> I hit the button. Where am I? Where am I supposed to be? 
So last week I'm all by myself, so I had to actually think about what I was doing, pay attention to where I'm driving and things like that. So I'm leaving the parking garage uh, in Orlando to go back towards the airport, and I pull, I pull out of the garage, and of all things I was talking before about African-American people, this beautiful girl there, she's an African-American girl, gorgeous smile, and she's taking my 22 bucks or whatever. So I said, listen, help me with this. When I, when I leave the garage, which way do I turn to start towards the airport? Oh, she says, listen to this. She's something like this. She says, okay, so we'll turn right and go about a block and then take a really quick left. Then go along until you see 408 under the overpass, but don't take the first loop by the overpass. Take the second loop. You're looking for 408B. And she starts saying, I said, what? <laughs> right, Bill? Huh? I almost said, do you have nothing to do? I'll give you $50 to drive me to the airport. I said, say that again? So she started again. I said, oh, okay, I got it. And I said, no kidding. I said, I'll, I'll do my best. I'll pray. And she looks at me. She says, pray and believe. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, <laughs> hallelujah, right? That was my word from the Lord that day. I said, you got it, sister. Amen, right? So I got to the airport there eventually, and uh, I made the plan, et cetera. Pray and believe. So you don't have to raise your hand. Don't respond to this. It's a rhetorical question. But in your heart, answer this question. Did you ever feel like, oh, what's the use of praying for heaven's sake? The world's getting bad and worse all the time. It doesn't much matter. But it, it can matter. Remember when Jesus came upon the little girl that had died? And it says, it says almost as an instant, like, chased everybody out of the room. Like, they're all in there. And he said, she's going to be okay. She's not dead. She's asleep. They all laughed at him. He said, okay, get rid of these people. That's what he said. I don't want these people in here. with me. I can't, I can't do anything with these people. Get them out of here. Unbelief. So let me close by retelling a story which I like to do in the third service. It's 30 years ago. It's more than that. It's 30, 1984, 85. We have this little church of 150, 200 people in the Hudson Valley in New York. We opened the very first crisis pregnancy center in the state of New York. We got licensed. Our unbelieving Jewish lawyer named Milton took care of that for he loved what we were doing, good guy. He filed all our documents. We opened this little center, right, Donna? We trained about 100 counselors. It was great. Everybody's all zealous. These gals are coming in with unwanted, unplanned pregnancies, and our counselors are helping them, talking to them, and feeling good about it. It's gone along great for about a year. And then some totally wicked and evil person in the area squealed, you might say, on us, brought to the attention of the attorney general that we were operating as a medical clinic without a medical clinic license. And actually, I learned that that was true. We were, because what we, we had was our counselors would do pregnancy tests for gals. And the, the law said in order to do that, you must have a, a medical doctor or a DO, an MD, or a nurse on hand all the time. That You know, you and I can't just do that. So I didn't know that. So we get this notice. I get this notice from the uh, assistant attorney general for the state of New York downstate that I'm to appear before him because within 10 days, his office is going to close our little center for violation of whatever. We have about 35 cents to, you know, litigate this. But I went around and others helped. And we, were out, we lined up hundreds of people. This is a great story. It's a true story. You know, preachers exaggerate everything. This is true. <laughs> right, Donna, you remember this? We lined up scads of people. And they're supposed to pray that morning, Friday morning, from like 10 to 12, when we're going to go before the Attorney General. So they're praying, and I, I, we drive up there to Poughkeepsie, and I've got my unbelieving friend Milton, my Jewish attorney, with me, and he says, I have no idea what we're going to say to this guy. I don't think this is going to work. I said, hang with me, Milton. Stay here. So we get there, right? And the whole thing's designed to intimidate. The government office is like 30 stories. It's all granite and brass and stuff. You get into the attorney general's office, and the carpet's this thick, and you've got a little folding chair sort of to sit on. He's in a desk eight feet high, right? Looks, this is how you feel. Like, the whole thing is designed to totally freak you out. You know, you're about to be eaten alive. But I was optimistic. And I had people praying. And um, I was doubly optimistic when I sat down and I looked. He had an Italian name. I thought, oh, that's good. He's probably Catholic, right? And I had almost memorized the Pope's encyclical on the unborn. I thought I'd quote it to him. That would help, right? But I thought, I bet he's pro-life or he's at least guilty. So he's, he said, he was very polite. He said, well, Pastor, um, 
look, I read this over, and actually you are in violation the way you're doing this. I said, yeah, I guess we are. He said, what are you doing? So I told him, he said, yeah, you're in violation. And then he looked at me, honestly, he could feel the prayers. He looked at me and said, but how can I help you? I'd like to try and help you. He said, I love it, right? I said, well, the thing is with the test, right? He said, yeah, the test. And then God gave me such, I mean, it was a great moment. I, I'm just not smart enough to have thought of this on my own. So I, so I said to him, well, look, you know these pregnancy tests that have just come out, you can go up to the CVS and buy this. Am I free to go buy one of those? He said, sure. I said, am I free to buy one and give it to my neighbor, a gal I know who wonders if she's pregnant? He said, yeah, you can do that. Sure. Can I buy 500 of them? <laughs> he said, yeah. I said, can I buy 500 of them and take them back to my little center and put them on the counter and tell my counselors, don't touch anybody and don't touch the urine samples or anything else. Give the gals this test and show them where the ladies' room is and let them test themselves? He said, great idea. He said, in fact, if you do that, this office will not bother you. He said, do that. The guy's on my side. You should have seen Milton. I looked over and said, Milton, amen. He goes, amen. <laughs> People were praying. Yeah. Go ahead, man. Had to be people praying. Sad note, a couple of years later, after Don and I were here in Michigan back in 88, they closed that little center. They thought, well, it's not enough interest in it anymore. People aren't coming out. I thought, oh, that's pathetic. That's pathetic. Yeah, another one, a couple of them had opened, but they lost their blessing. If you go on our website, you will find this, this uh, thing that you can click, Pray for Life. Is it 13, 15 pages? 30, a lot of pages. All about uh, a resource guide for praying for the unborn. I, I think our church... Cornerstone can stand pretty tall in Christ on this, although we don't want to get guilty of pride. But we better stay this way. Yeah, I've mentioned uh, you all heard it now. We're moving on in a couple of years. But whoever succeeds me in this office, that's the first thing that the committee should be asking. You're going to carry on our pro life mantle, aren't you? Better do that. Why? Because God likes it. And He's a God of wrath at times. Don't get yourself America is hanging by a thread. Be prayerful, especially about this issue of the unborn. Pray with me, please. Father in heaven, we are blessed to have your mercies. We are blessed at your kindness. And we are blessed, as the old King James says, at your um, forbearance, your long suffering. We're blessed to have tomorrow be a day when we remember a man who lost his life speaking out for those being treated unjustly just as the Lord Jesus did and we're blessed to be reminded that the unborn have just as much right to life as any of us sitting here I pray for the, the woman or man who've had this in their past because even if they're beyond it now it still hurts they have someone waiting for them at the gate I know that I pray for our young people here scattered in the sanctuary, these young men and women. Thank you for the gift of sexual passion, but it is so clearly subject to the entrance of sin. And we're living in this, this vulgar culture that has turned sexual activity into the national sport and then taken away the consequences by making it possible to just destroy the unborn. So I pray for these young, we pray, I pray for these young people. Help them to be smart because you reward virtue and keep them pure. We pray for the person who's here this morning who doesn't know you and not sure what in the world they're doing here to begin with, much less hearing all of this. We pray that heart would be open, that mind would be made clear. I pray forgive us as a nation. We pray for our president. He's a real puzzle to us, Lord. I speak 
certainly for myself, not maybe not for everybody, but he's a puzzle. He's a bright guy. And he's got this tender side. But he's a puzzle. I pray even now that one day soon he'd have the big epiphany where your spirit would speak to him. He has not helped the unborn. He's made it worse. And for those in Congress and in the state houses and the governors, oh God, if it be good in your sight, be merciful. And let them see what Lincoln saw. That you reward nations according to their iniquity. And you are altogether righteous in so doing. Let them see. How can we picture, O oh God, what would happen within a month if America all looked up and said, let's stop killing our own children, for starters? Somehow we suspect there'd be no more problem with terror or a lot of other things. The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, and he directs it as he wants to, like a course of water along the way. We pray for America. We pray for our churches in the area, the ones that say they're evangelical, that mean business with the Bible. Bring them to repentance if they're asleep on this issue, or if they don't want to bother anybody about it. Pray for me. We pray for all of us, men and women, who, whose eyes are filled with lust and whose flesh gets away from them easily. You are a God of justice. Justice. It's a good thing the Son of God went before us. When we think of the song. We're going to sing it to you now, Lord. We're going to sing it aloud as an act of worship. We cannot tell how he whom angels worship should set his love upon the sons of men and grace this place of tears, Jesus. Come and be among us. Why would you do that? You're the same one that watched Cain come up behind Abel. You let that happen. And then you came in and brought them nail you to the cross. This we know, Jesus. All flesh shall see your glory. All flesh. There'll be a day of judgment, a day of accounting. And then those who belong to you will sing, at last, at last, the Savior of the world is come. We don't know how that's going to work, Lord Jesus. Is that here? Is it Michigan? Jerusalem? Is it a planet and a place, a garden spot a billion miles from here that we'll be, to which we'll be transported in a minute? Who knows? We don't know. We just know this. We cannot tell. But this we know. The skies shall fill with gladness. We commit ourselves and our nation and these laws and our lawmakers and our churches to you and we pray, Jesus, in your blessed name. Amen.